Lee here with Paul and Josh from Emmanuel. And we would like to have a little bit of a chat today and hopefully you can enter into this discussion with us as we discuss some things from Genesis that we've not been able to tackle during the regular messages. Mm -hmm. uh, as we go through Genesis 1 and 2 and even beyond, there's all kinds of controversial things that come up in the text that there's no time for on a regular Sunday to tackle. And so we're going to we're going to give you some ideas of how you can understand some of the hard things that come up in Genesis. This is a conversational thing. We're not looking to be really in depth, but we want to give you some ideas of how you can understand the word of God and answer some of the questions that you may have. So one of the main questions that people have is how to understand Genesis 1 and 2 uh, in terms of hermeneutics. Hermeneutics is how we interpret the Bible. Right. And so when you read Genesis 1, it reads quickly through, almost like poetry, um, you know, and God said, and it was very good. And God said, and it was very good. It goes all the way through the chapter. And then chapter 2, as you know, it reads a little bit more like narrative. Yeah. And it's a little bit different genre. So here's the question. How do we understand Genesis 1 and 2? Do we read them like the same kind of literature? Is it literal? Is it a myth? Is it allegory? Is it poetry? How do we understand that hmm. to be truly biblical Christians as we read through? Well, there's a lot to unpack there, hmm. but um, I think the starting point is just like you said, Lee, you look at it and say, okay, Genesis 1 and 2 largely tell us about the same event, but hmm. they do it from different angles. Uh, you know, they, um, on the one hand, Genesis 1 is sort of on a cosmic level, isn't it? It's telling us about how the heavens and the earth were created and, and uh, you know, the lights in the skies and so on and so forth. It's grand scale stuff. It's sort of heaven's perspective stuff. Uh, Genesis 2, all of a sudden, like we get boots on the ground in the dust of the earth and uh, the green is right there in front of our faces. And uh, it's so, so they're told from different perspectives on one level. Uh, and then we see, yeah, there's a change in genre in terms of how they read. You just start reading the first one and, and it's rhythmic and it's poetic in Genesis 1 um, in a way that we don't normally talk mm. and we don't normally recount historic events in that sort of way, even though it's telling us about a historic event. There's something a little unique there about this, this creation narrative as it's told from that angle. And then Genesis 2, it starts to feel much more like how we would typically uh, tell something that happened, tell a story right. that happened historically. So there's, mm. there's a little shift in those ways. Mm. Um, that's significant. That's oh. not uh, unusual in scripture like the gospels. That's mm. right. Uh, you read the gospels and you find the accounts are not identical. And yet when you look at them, they are complementary. Mm. One will talk about donkeys and the other will talk about a donkey. Mm -hmm. And uh, sometimes one is bringing it from one perspective, another writer br brings another perspective, but they are harmonious. That's why we have what they call the harmony of the Gospels. So we see that throughout Scripture, and uh, it, it doesn't make Scripture invalid. In fact, um, it confirms it. Gives us a fuller picture, doesn't it? We think yeah. about how similar Matthew, Mark, and Luke are. Yeah. How John tells the same stories, but in fact, well, Matthew, Mark, and Luke are the same story, same sort of angle, and in the same sort of way. John is different altogether, altogether from them. Yeah. Exact same stories about the exact same people and the exact same Jesus, and, and we find how they fit together in a harmonious way. Uh, same is true in the Old Testament. Think about the narrative of First and Second Samuel, yeah. First and Second Kings, Kings, and First yeah. and Second Chronicles, and how that all fits and overlaps together. Together, they give us a fuller picture. Somehow, God in his wisdom has known that to give us multiple angles of, of story about the same events will right. help us have a fuller picture mm. of him, of how he's working in this world, of who he's created us to be and the life he calls us to live. So yeah, so that's not unusual, is it? I like, uh, I like the language here, the very last verse of Genesis 1, God saw all that he had made and it was very good mm -hmm. and there was evening and there was morning, the sixth day. And thus, chapter 2, verse 1, thus the heavens and the earth were completed in all their vast array. Mm -hmm. And then you go to verse 4 of chapter 2. So that first verse looks back at chapter 1 and says, the heavens and the earth were completed. End of story. Mm -hmm. And yet then chapter 2, verse 4 says, this is the account of the heavens and the earth when they were created. So 
It's the same language looking backwards and looking forward to chapter two. So you can't read chapter one as being different than chapter two in a sense, hmm. no. because it's the same language that Moses, God through Moses uses as chapter one and chapter two. Echoing so them both. It really kind of it's from one to the other. Yeah, it's reminding us. It's a harmony of both. Yeah. 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 We've talked a little bit, Lee, briefly about how that language, um, this is the account of, yeah. is, is a formula in Genesis. Uh, the Hebrew word is toledot, I believe. Mm. I'm, I'm, I'm sure I'm not pronouncing that correctly, but it's a formula that comes up actually, I think, 12 times in Genesis to signal sort of a an account. We're in this sort of story and, mm. and uh, yeah, signals transition. So here's another question that comes out of chapter one and chapter two. Mm -hmm. um, when we think in terms of, is it poetry? Some people think that this story is myth. Did a snake really talk? Hmm. Yeah, good question. Uh, my uh, my sincere preference, serious preference, is that we read it and take it as naturally uh, as it, it would seem to present itself mm. to be able to say, um, when we read that, I believe we're meant to understand that these are real people mm. in a real garden where there are real things that are happening that are beyond natural. We understand we don't live in an entirely natural world. Mm. What we're seeing happening around us most of the time is natural, but there's supernatural things at, at play there. So um, while well, some might read that and say, there's no such thing as a talking snake. There's no such thing as sort of magical fruit. This is, yeah. uh, this is myth in the sense of not uh, entirely real allegorical type of myth, you know, when they, when they mean it in that sort of way, um, that gives us a picture of something from the past. Uh, I would say, well, I think we need to be careful there because of what you brought up, the idea of hermeneutics. What is mm -hmm. the way that we'll, the, the hermeneutic, the approach we'll use to understand scripture? Um, if we say uh, there's no such thing as a talking snake, so this could not be, uh, you know, literal history that played out, we're going to have a problem later when we get to Balaam, who has a talking donkey. Yeah. Right? And it reads very much like historical narrative. There really can be no question at that point in the scriptures this is a historical narrative and a donkey starts talking. So if a donkey can talk, um, we should we should presuppose that a snake could talk too. And, and even if a snake talked, mm -hmm. then we almost have to believe in a literal Adam and Eve in the same story. Oh, that's the most important we part. We don't believe in a snake talking yeah. and all that that meant, then how could we believe in Adam and Eve that was that was real? Are real parents, right? Yeah, that I think is the most important part. So uh, no matter where we land in our understanding of Genesis 2, uh, we need to make sure that we, we have given away far, far too much. Mm. And we're in all kinds of trouble in terms of the doctrine of salvation if it's not a literal Adam and a literal Eve. Because by the time we come to Romans, we understand that sin entered the world through those first humans. One and man. because of yeah. that, we all live in sin. But because of the one man, Christ, we find a redemption from sin. So right. if we don't have a yeah. single starting point with the very first people of sin entering the world and a literal mm. Adam and a literal Eve, we're in big, big trouble. We've given away far too much and uh, we'll find our faith is starting to crumble at that point. I know that the, the idea of one set of parents becomes challenging in that next generation. Where did all the kids come from? Paul, you're telling me a story yeah. from your history of how mm. that kind of makes sense for you. When I was... Um we were in India and you'd talk to a, a, a people about their families and you'd say, how many children do you have? And they would say, um, three. <laughs> and uh, then you would have to ask the second question, how many daughters do you have? Oh, four. Mm. In other words, when they were talking about their family, they talked about the sons, but the daughters were not part of the, uh, of the picture because they would all be given away to other families. Mm. And uh, I think that um, it's important to realize people say, well, where did Cain get his wife? <laughs> well, he probably married a sister, but we don't have any record of that sister. We only have record of three sons. Mm. So uh, uh, that's kind of the way it is in the East. Mm. I know in much of the Muslim world, uh, they will marry their their daughters off to someone within the family. And uh, it doesn't become part of the official record, but that is the way it works in order to keep things going. And so you keep the, you keep the money within the context of the family hmm. and you give the daughter away to somebody else. So uh, where, did you, where did King get his wife? Probably one of his sisters.
Hmm. Which makes sense, doesn't it, when we think about uh, God's command, he makes humans, male and female, he creates them. So we have Adam and Eve. Mm -hmm. He gives us our place. Uh, we're made in the image of God. We're meant to rule over creation. And uh, he gives Mandate, us the instruction, right? that's right. And he gives us the instruction to be fruitful and multiply right. and fill the earth. Right. And uh, so how are, how are Cain and Abel going to be pursuing that? If they're not looking around and saying, well, they need to find for themselves a wife, then where they can embrace God's design for marriage, as we see in Genesis 2, and then start to be fruitful and multiply yeah. and fill the earth. They're going to have to find a sister uh, and uh, choose a sister, which sounds rather strange, strange now. icky, even <laughs> to us, for good reason. God's now made it clear that uh, for us to marry somebody that's closely related to us, it's incest, it's sinful, it's wrong, yeah. but but you have the first people there where uh, that law's not in place. Mm -hmm. Where to fulfill that mandate, they're going to have to be able to do that, at least for the first generation. And, uh, you know, further, I think all kinds of questions come up about birth defects and genetics. Yeah. And when you get uh, too inbred, uh, you have the most pure sort of genetic code possible with the first people that God's yeah. made. There has been time. Those issues really didn't exist at that weren't time. Really a problem, were right. they? Yeah, yeah. That's right. Hey, I wonder if we could chat for a minute about another big issue that comes up right away in Genesis 1 and 2, yeah. and that is creation versus evolution. Mm. I was raised in a secular school system, as, as are most of us in this culture now, and we are not raised with the idea of creation. Mm -hmm. We are taught evolution from start to finish, the Big mm -hmm. Bang, led to everything that's, that is here. Mm -hmm. And so we were not an intelligent design. We just arrived on the planet from um, some other force. And so here's the, here's the question. Can a biblical Christian believe in evolution? Well, perhaps we could look at it this way. Not just narrow it to evolution, but many people look at uh, the Genesis account of days do they have to be 24 hour days? Mm -hmm. uh, a day with the Lord is as a thousand day, years and so on. Um, you know, we as believing Christians who have a personal living relationship with Jesus Christ uh, find that among believers, there are differences of opinion. They take the same word of God that you and I have and believe it with all their heart and have trusted Christ and have a personal relationship. But some of them, uh, view baptism in a different way than some of us. Mm. And uh, the, uh, the uh, celebration of the Lord's Supper, some of them view that differently than we do mm. as well. And uh, is it possible for someone who didn't believe in a 24-hour a uh, day, as in Genesis 1, and they felt it was a longer period of time? I don't agree with that, but in my mind, there are many people who are fine believers who find that a very com comfortable position to have. And uh, therefore, we recognize the fact that among the believing community, people taking the same word of God and who believe the word of God and believe in the inspiration of the word of God do interpret some things differently. For example, the second coming, the events mm -hmm. of the second coming. Mm -hmm. And so we've got a lot of those issues among this group of people we can call the family of God. Mm -hmm. And uh, therefore we have to give them some space while we hold our own convictions. So, I, Go so I wonder whether uh, the question then becomes, is there a, a room for Darwinian evolution in a Christian faith? Yeah, you this know, is a great question. Do we, things, do we see things differently there? I, I really appreciate what you said there, Paul. You know, here we are sitting around the table, and as I've come to know you men, the three of us are all six-day young earth literal creationists. Yeah. Uh, and, and yet, um, Paul is advocating for sort of a generous view towards those who wouldn't share that position mm -hmm. with us. And we're trying to find now... Uh, sort of where are the areas where we want to be very generous and gracious? And then where are the areas where we'd say, oh, okay, now we've given away too much again. We're, in, we're into a really sort That's of right. vulnerable, dan dangerous position mm -hmm. for our faith. Um, so we, we look at this and say, okay, on the one hand, we're asking, could somebody be a Christian and believe certain things? 
then we just need to go back, I think, to the gospel and right. say, what do we need to believe to be a Christian? That's right. Uh, that centers on the person of Christ. That centers on his redemptive work. That's that centers right. on his death and his resurrection and his divinity. Um, and I, I fear that as someone who is a six-day young earth yeah. liberal creationist, I fear that some of the atmosphere I grew up in um, looked at someone who didn't agree with that position and said, you're out. You couldn't be yeah. a Christian and be that. And that drew the line in the wrong spot. Mm -hmm. um, now, though, you ask it somebody, uh, what, what happens when we get to sort of uh, Darwinian evolution? Right. You are going to very quickly find that you cannot hold to both at the same time. Uh, so as, as that yeah. Christian is maturing in their faith and they're finding how those things overlap, uh, the biblical account leaves zero room for Darwinian evolution. In it's, other words, we've come from anything but God. That's right, because that's right, Darwinian evolution says it's, it's an accident, no and it says survival of the fittest is a thing right. that directs that, that overarching law, directs the, the, the sort of uh, the way the accidents play out. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and the scriptural account is, no, no, there is a God, and he is sovereign, and he creates, and he's a hands-on God. So it, the biblical account says we must have a theistic, single God, sovereign God worldview, and Darwinian evolution is opposed to that. Well, Darwinian evolution, you find people who hold to that, what will not hold to the authority of Scripture. That's right. Yeah. And they will not hold to the person of Jesus Christ as being the redeemer for the world. Right. It all goes in one basket. Yeah. And uh, so while there may be a little bit of room in the interpretation of, of the Genesis account as to the length of time and so on till I am a six day. That's what I was raised. Mm -hmm. And uh, I read it that way and I'm old and I'm not gonna change. <laughs> and I, I accept the biblical account is the way it is. And, but I also recognize that I know some fine uh, believing people who have, uh, have a little broader view of the Genesis account. Yeah. And I'm, I'm ready to accept that. But Darwinianism is, you will find, it will have nothing to do with Scripture. It won't be compatible. Nothing to do with the, the, the person of Christ and yeah. redemption. I, I've, what I found so enlightening for me was years ago, Paul, talking with uh, dear friends and fellow pastors who were not six-day young earth literal creationists and uh, asking, now tell me why? Expecting them to say, because science has told us, yeah. at which point I'd say, well, okay, my source of authority is God's word. Yeah. But finding that instead they said, because they believed that the genre of Genesis 1 and 2 was not intended to give us the scientific answers that we're looking for. Yeah. Mm. And that the genre, that, that when we tried, this was their belief, when we tried to see those things there, we imposed on the text something that the Lord never intended for it to have. Now, I don't agree with them on that, uh, but that was eye-opening for me. It's an interesting perspective. Mm -hmm. To start to see that those brothers and sisters were genuinely searching the scriptures for what God's word intends to communicate to us and uh, uh, landing on a different conclusion and finding there we could we can have grace, we can have love and That's peace exactly. and unity with one another. Uh, when I'm talking with somebody and they say they don't believe in the six day young earth creation, yeah. and I ask, no, tell me why, and they say because science says. Then I'm then I'm saying, okay, let's go back. I've got a little yeah. bit of concern. What's going yeah. to tell us about how the world works and yeah. who we are and why we're what here? What is going to be the final authority? That's, That's right. right. That's, That's right. And, and so that's we're, what the answer is. We want to allow God's word to stand, and all of us together are searching for what does God's word intend? What does he want to communicate yeah. to us through his word? And we believe that he's communicating this position that we've landed on, but we want to be gracious to some who, who arrive in a different spot and uh, recognizing that they're, depending where you land in that, it may prove to be compatible as we move forward, but be very careful of where it doesn't prove to be compatible mm -hmm. with the rest of the faith. And then right. you got to say, okay, we've got a problem. We need to move back to this and uh, refine it further. And one of those key uh, items in Genesis 1 is, for example, verse 25, mm. that says, uh, God created all the creatures that move along the ground according to their kinds. Yeah. 
So it's almost like there's a micro evolution thing there. Yes. There's a change within the kind of animal. But that's yeah. not to say that a fish becomes a bird or whatever. That's right. It's amazing. Hey, man, that's what I, I believe what Darwin had truly noted yeah. is the sort of what we might call micro evolution. Yeah. And say, yeah, according to their kinds, things get stronger and better and develop certain attributes and uh, yeah. in ways that God has graciously put into our genetic code to mm -hmm. serve us well. And uh, you say, okay, that kind of thing tends to happen and we see that in the world around us. And Darwin seems to have noticed that, but taken it to an extent that, uh, that he, could, he could remove the need for a God. Yeah. And, uh, and, and that's where we get into some really serious trouble. So he just went far, far too far. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah. Mm -hmm. So the big takeaway from Genesis one and two, in the beginning, God created. Yeah, amen. Well, guys, thanks for a great conversation today. Appreciate all of your insight. And for those of you who've been tuning in, we're glad that you've joined us today for this video. If you have more questions that come out of the text from the sermon series, we want to hear from you because we want to answer your questions, the stuff you're still wondering about from Genesis. So shoot us an email, talk to us at church, and we will try and incorporate those questions into the following videos. By the way, make sure you check out the church library. There's a great section there on creation resources. And so reach out to the librarians and get the information you need. We will see you next time.